The city-states of Dailan, a wild region of open plains, unexplored forest and shack communities. The people worshipped pagan gods, were deemed culturally backwater by most of their neighbors, and often too poor for any trade. While often isolated, they belonged to the Freedomland Federation, a region that stretched from the Raltorian border to the northern coast of the Deucavim. While a federation in name only, most of the city-states, principalities, and tribal kingdoms within the Freedom Lands were often at war with each other over territorial and religious disputes. It seemed no one could agree on anything, and fighting was often the first and only answer. Scarcely a year can go by without violence erupted to the lands to the north. Such hostile people turn their rivers more to blood than water. The region was mired in turmoil and seemed teetering on the state of anarchy, with the smoke of burning settlements often blowing across the border. Even attempts from the neighboring nations of Coventry and Vernon Plains to stabilize the region ended in failure. It seemed the Freedom Lands would never be at peace. But peace often came through war, and one man's attempt to end the fighting would turn the Dylonian city-states into the foundation of his new empire. Karis Malkovich was born into a minor noble family of John. Growing up in the Middle Districts, his family was considered poor and lacked much of the influence most of the larger ruling families of the kingdom could wield. The youngest of two brothers and a sister, his family could not afford an expensive education nor secure him a high political or military rank in the government through bribes and payoffs as most nobles and John often did. So instead, Karis was forced to join the army at the relatively young age of 15, taking on the rank of lieutenant, but quickly gained the recognition from his commanders due to his disciplined and studious nature, quickly leading to a series of promotions. With his newfound command, Karis attempted to reform the lower city districts, trying to reduce crime and eliminate many of the gangs plaguing the city's depths. However, most of the families refused to fund his efforts and blocked the local barracks from supplying support. Karis soon found his guard alone would not be enough to bring change, and if he was to have any real impact on the city, he would need to become politically active. Dabbling in politics, he tried to bring about anti-corruption laws and end the system of bribes that controlled much of the government. But few listened to his ideologies, and he was often blacklisted among the elite and barred from political debates. Becoming discouraged with the endless infighting and corruption of the noble families, he felt the entire system was rotting from within. The nobles only focusing on themselves and passing laws that favored the families while leading to the mass neglect of most of its citizens. Feeling like an outcast, his loyalty to John waning, he began looking elsewhere to make a difference. A place that needed him. A place where he could start over. A place like the Freedom Land Federation. The Freedom Lands, he would often say to the officers under his command, is a name that is both enticing and promising. The Freedom Lands, a place with no kings, no corruption. The Freedom Lands, a place where he could start over. While his talks were treasonous, many under his command wished to restart their lives, as well as the degradation of their kingdom, no secret, their future uncertain. The promise of starting over spread through his ranks, and quickly his guards begged him to take them. And what more noble of a cause could he have than helping his own people? Not all who heard agreed, however, and there were those who felt his words of desertion made him a traitor. 
Quickly the families discussed Karis' intent, and quickly each wanted the other families to shoulder the responsibility and cost of stopping him. Karis knew he had to act soon if he was going to go forth with his plan. Before the families could agree on how to deal with him, he had to take advantage of the confusion and leave. He patrolled the depths of John one last time to remind himself the world could be better, then met with his commanders and discussed what to do next. They had little time to prepare and would be massively outnumbered if all the city's garrisons mobilized against them, but they had one advantage. They were disciplined compared to the common guard, and their time spent in the lower city had honed their skills as a fighting force. Should it come to blows, Karis was confident he could overpower the garrisons by concentration of force and defeat in detail. Karis had 24 hours before the families gathered to discuss his demotion. He relied now on his soldier's speed, and word was sent that all those who wished to follow him were to gather their loved ones and bring only what they could carry to the docks before sunrise tomorrow. To hide the movements of 10,000 soldiers and 30,000 civilians, he needed to move at night and distract the city's garrisons. But most importantly, the four barracks in the docks district, he could not afford a prolonged engagement. He sent out runners to set fire across several districts, and as expected, most of the local garrisons were called to put out the flames, including his own. To prevent suspicion, he sent those without families to aid with the fire, while the rest of his force prepared to take the docks district. Third Regiment, under Lieutenant Colonel Daniels, moved towards the Iron Guard barracks, while Fourth Regiment, led by Lieutenant Colonel Xanthrin, went to take the Celestial Lions. Both barracks were undermanned due to the fire, and the guards put up only minor resistance before surrendering. With the main roads to the docks now secure, Karas moved most of the guards' families towards the shipyards, relatively unseen. However, he still needed the docks themselves. Second Regiment, led by Colonel Python, was already stationed near the docks at the barracks the Guard's Angel, and when word came that the Iron Guard and Celestial Lions were taken, Python moved. The Naval Guard, made up of mostly merchant mercenaries, were quickly routed, and Python seized the docks in a matter of 30 minutes. Within 15 more, civilians and soldiers were already loading onto the ships. Things were going smoothly, but if Karis wanted the perimeter secure, he would need to subdue the east side barracks. Karis, taking 1st Regiment, headed towards the Battle Guard barracks, while Lieutenant Colonel Andrews with 5th Regiment had instructions to take on the Stone Shield garrison. Karis caught the Battle Guards in surprise, many still asleep leaving only a handful of sentries on duty, and was able to take the barracks without a fight. However, Andrews' force struggled to cross the bridges, as the roads were unusually busy due to the fires. The Stone Shields were alerted to Andrew's advance, and sent word to Lord Vanderborn Karis was now in rebellion. The Stone Shields deployed archers to pelt Andrew's regiment along the bridge, and a brief skirmish took place as Andrew ordered his muskets to open fire into the surrounding buildings. While it pinned the archers, this sent the nearby civilians into a panic. Andrews tried to advance through the mob, but lost formation and had to withdraw, sending word to Karis the district was not secure. Karis ordered his civilians along the main road to make haste, drop all extra gear, and take only food and water for the voyage. Speed was now of the essence. Karis sent a runner to his soldiers in the fire brigade to withdraw, and as they moved south, they came under attack from the stone shields. They were forced to scatter through the alleys and trickle towards the docks. Meanwhile, Lord Vanderborn took three brigades off the fire line to engage Karis's force. He claimed he would crush the rebellion in a single night. Karis sent both his regiment and Andrews to the dock to begin withdrawing, while he moved to the Iron Guard barracks to take control of 3rd Regiment. He moved Lieutenant Colonel Xanthrin's regiment north to the bridge and secured the main roads. Lord Vanderborn's 2nd Brigade reached the dock district first, 
but found Xanthrin's guard already in position, and after a brief engagement, was forced to retreat. Lord Vandeborn's first brigade tried to engage Karas, but found he had brought up several cannons and were able to repel each of the brigade's advances. Lord Vandeborn's third brigade flanked across the city towards the battle guard barracks, taking the small garrison of soldiers Karas left behind and linked up with the stone shields. They then moved towards the docks to cut off Karas's retreat, but found Colonel Python's regiment already blocking the advance. A brief firefight broke out, and Python ordered a charge. He could not afford to have the brigade harass their flank all night, and believed he could take them on in hand to hand. The two sides clashed briefly, but Lord Vandeborn's 3rd Brigade was poorly equipped and poorly led. They broke in minutes and fell back to the battle guard's barracks, where they remained for the night. As the last of the civilians were loaded onto the ships, Xanthrin's forces were called off the line, and Karis fought a defensive battle all the way down to the docks, keeping Vandeborn's 1st and 2nd Brigade at bay. They withdrew onto the docks and set fire to all the surrounding ships so they could not be pursued, and then set out to sea. Karis lost few soldiers in the endeavor, 43 dead, 163 wounded, and 255 missing or captured. Compared to Lord Vandeborn's 215 dead and 420 wounded, but with one challenge over, a new one began. He had 40,000 people to look after, without homes, without belongings, and headed for a land that didn't even know he was coming. Things seemed, for the first time, uncertain. Could he lead them, take care of their needs, and give all that he promised? He didn't know, but for now he paused as the sun rose and he took a breath. It was a new beginning.